Hi, thanks everyone for joining me this morning. Uh, as I said, my name is Darren Barnes, um, and my talk today is here to sort of, I guess, uh, talk about a passion I have, if you will, for help in my organization, so that's the Office for National Statistics in the UK, uh, build better data that'll support better insights, better analysis, and makes our statistical data as accessible and as inclusive as it can be. So, the power behind our data needs to be leveraged as easily as it can be by the people and the services that need to or want to consume it, right? So as an organization, we need to kind of shift away from this handcrafted spreadsheet paradigm that we have uh, and move towards a more standards-based approach. And one that is baked into our internal processes at the earliest stage possible and not bolted on afterwards when it comes to publishing something on a website. So building data with sort of common standards, common code lists, harmonizing things where we can, uh, that prepares a foundation for a better data-driven future for our organization and for our users. But think about it. So if you're building foundations, you don't just dig a hole and pour concrete into that hole and you hope for the best that it's not going to crack and your house fall down. You need to strengthen that with kind of supporting materials, right? And for us in this space, that uh, supporting material is the metadata. We need to weave as much of this stuff into the fabric of our data sets and make it integral, as integral as the observations themselves. Uh, metadata is the context. It gives meaning to our data and provides a level of trust and clarity that our users really need of any data sets that we release. It shouldn't be an afterthought, right? We shouldn't just be putting metadata in as footnotes, on reference tabs, or in documents that are actually situated away from the data itself. So, for those working in data, that makes absolute sense, right? This is, this is just common sense. It's not a lack of a vision that's the difficult part here. The hardest part is, you know, uh, the kind of the development or the deployments of the technology the culture within organizations and with people who produce data, uh, the investment from our leaders, and the leap of faith it requires to kind of move into a new way of doing things and not just stick into the sort of decades of legacy that we've built up in producing Excel files that we just simply attach to our websites. And let's face it, right, continuing a path of least resistance is always a good idea. No one wants to do more work. Of course it don't. So we need to support another way than just expecting people to change. We need to be able to help our teams onto that better path and give them the means to take the journey with us, right? So our mission is to help tool up, collaborate, consult, and educate our statisticians on how to do this. So here's some examples of the types of things I'm sure people would have seen from spreadsheets. Uh, data is often provided in sort of many different layouts. Uh, it's the producer who ultimately dis uh, decides on the display of this data, right? So how the labels look, how they might uh, change certain things to make it look more appealing, like the labels or acronyms and things like this. Uh, but it means there's little consistency uh, as each producer will do their own thing. And if we have 4,000 outputs that we produce every year in the ONS, that's a lot of outputs that look a lot different all the time. So we need to kind of change that in a uh, sorry, individual style into a much more meaningful structured element. So in order to help us kind of understand and, and the ability to make our tables read any way they want, it makes it difficult to work with. And in this example here, you've got 2019. Is it a calendar year? Is it a financial year? I have no idea, because I can't see in terms of any of the, the current metadata that exists for it. Are the labels for the industry types, are they the same thing? Can I compare them? Can I not? I don't know. I have to go off to somewhere else to identify where these, these codes have come from. So we want our suppliers to be using common labels, consistent code lists, providing the information about the attributes, the notations, in a consistent manner. This gives the opportunity for us to build relationships between the data and other data sets that exist out there. Uh, and it adds levels of confidence, right, in terms of 
a user can be more certain and they can appreciate what they're looking at and perhaps uh, get the data that they want much more quickly and actually see whether or not there's data that exists elsewhere that might meet the same and similar criteria. And we think that CSVW or CSV on the web uh, is the kind of format of choice for us. And we see that being uh, quite a good standard for us to be able to support that change, that consistency within the organization. I'm hoping that some of you have heard of CSVW. It is a standard for the World Wide Web Consortium. Uh, but just in case, it's not a single file format. It's made up of a, a sort of standard, tidy CSV uh, with a JSON file attached to it, which squeezes all that really good metadata in. Uh, and it's basically a subset of a standard document format uh, for linked data, right? So it's JSON-LD. Uh, the standard defines and validates the structure and supports the transformation from that CSV into the kind of JSON or RDF world. It allows fully extensible uh, metadata and use, uh, uses externally defined vocabularies. And that's really important, right? Because we want to be able to use standards across the web and not just keep redefining new ones all the time. So crucially, it allows us to turn everything, all the data, all the, all the kind of um, uh, code lists and things uh, into URIs. And that basically makes our data the API. So what does CSVW look like? Kind of on the left is the observation file but it expects to be in a kind of tidy format. So if you use R, you might, might be familiar with that term tidy, uh, but it's a row per observation type of thing. It prefers codes rather than human readable labels. And the codes and the code lists themselves are important, right? Because we bring them in from these, you know, these canonical lists, right? These external vocabularies. And it makes sure there's no ambiguity around what it is you identify. So a geography code or some other kind of classification out there, like the industry stuff I showed earlier on. So that helps that, uh, that helps the users that have that kind of source of truth that they need. And obviously then all these chronicle lists have their own human readable um, uh, formats anyway that we display to the user on the end, uh, on the websites. The JSON file that contains all the metadata, uh, we've defined a kind of application profile. My mouse is going mad. Gone. Uh, so yeah, we've defined a kind of application profile that we believe kind of manages all the, the metadata that, that we expect our users to be using. So in other words, we've done some user research. We found out what are the key elements of the data that you want described, right? What are the bits of information that you need that will make it easy for you to interpret this data? And we've reused other standards like DCAT, SCOS, RDF, XCOS, there's a whole bunch of other standards already exist. So cherry picking the best of those to make sure there's more consistent across the piece. And my mouse has gone a bit nuts. Okay. So it's an important part of labor on though is the fact that all this, this reference data, we have a kind of, uh, it's a, the CSVW is a precursor for us to meet our linked open our linked data ambitions. And to support that in this interoperability of our data with other data on the web is vital. We're trying to build a mighty knowledge graph of data, a web of data, if you like. And once we, we publish all our information, we make all that metadata open and publish for others to reuse as well. And that's really important, right? Because we want people to be reusing the same sets of classifications and code lists. And where we have our own, uh, we're using other external vocabularies, we're making sure we link to those. We're making sure that they are known entities that we're using, so we're not reinventing the wheel for the sake of it. Come on, one more thing. Oh, yeah. uh, another further value add, so once we've created our CSVW, we've got the JSON file, we've got the CSV, there's a tool that we're using, it's open source, it's available, it's called CSV to RDF, and it kind of adds that semantic layer to our data to provide that kind of linked data location, so you can see the subject predicate and object at the bottom. So it's providing that kind of build, it's, it's providing an easier way for our data to connect to other data on the web as well. So how are we gonna make this happen? So I said earlier on, we need to support our users, support them in a way that helps them onto that path. And so my team in, uh, in the ONS has created a kind of data pipeline, a, a system of a tooling that will help 
change that source file, that, that source data, whether it be tabular formats, whether it be from, through another API, through, through a database extra, extract, uh, to create that CSV doubling. So we're building this kind of heavy lifting equipment, if you like, in order to help move us towards a structured data and metadata. Uh, and this is the project they come up with. So again, it's all open source. Uh, you can find it on GitHub. I put links in at the end. Uh, but this CSV project is, is a kind of open source project available to all. It provides a kind of command line, um, a command line interface tool so you can turn your CSVs into that kind of five-star linked format. And we get a hoping that this standards-based approach will unlock network effects, right, to accelerate that kind of data analysis and make it easier for us to collate, compare, contrast data from different sources over the web. And all our data kind of depends on these open standards. So fast forward a few years down the line, uh, we've got all this, this, this wonderful linked open statistical data on the web, and we can offer this well-formatted data to everyone to anybody who wants to leverage the power of all this kind of statistical data we have, whether it be through APIs, whether it be, oop, go on, come back here, uh, whether it be through APIs, through data explorers, um, you know, the data is there in that kind of common, uh, consistent approach, or we can start training things like large, large language models to support even better answers. But now we have, we have the tools, we just have to have the education and the reliance on the, on, the, on, the, on the statisticians to help us drive this so we can build that solid foundation from which we want to build. As a publishing organization, we have this sort of structure and metadata means, and we can automate our processes so they're repeatable, they're less manually intensive, and our internal processes are much better. So we're developing other tools for, this, for a new CMS, which is a kind of block-based element so that we are creating content once, and reusing it through many different channels. Um, we're also building the ability, oh, so we're also building the capability that allows us to query the data in the repository to drive those visualizations like tables, charts, and maps, and other things. We want that data to enable better storytelling features, feeding social media directly, and kind of reaching new audiences. And more importantly, to help make our data so understandable that even that the less data literate people are understanding what they're seeing. Okay, uh, from this well-organized data, we can start to derive better insights with a wide range of resources, visualize the data in so many ways at the moment are very, very resource intensive to attain. But of course we can still have the tabular formats, but the best thing is the system is building those tabular formats for us. And that introduces a consistency to those formats which allows people to be a little bit, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, they can uh, use that data more consistently across the piece. And it meets accessibility requirements as well, which is really important. Uh, from, have we gone yet? Most don't want to play. Okay. Uh, in our CMS, we're building the queries so that we can generate these, these, these uh, images. And the best thing about having the data queried uh, to, to drive these, disc, uh, these uh, data visualizations means that we can actually power them automatically. So the next time we release more data, these charts are being updated without any interaction or manual interventions from us. And well, you know, it'll enable the likes of communities out there using data. Because the best things to be done with our data will be done by other people, right? As my old mate Tim says, you know, we're serendipitous, right? Uh, I think just a few shout outs last slide. Uh, links and credits, we've got the CSV Cubed project. We've got some information about the CSV W orgs, uh, some stuff on the ONS, the CSV to RDF. But a big shout out to my team. I basically nicked all their work. I've nicked all their words, I've nicked all their slides, right? So but I've just been lucky enough to be able to come to Argentina to talk about it. So uh, big thanks to Ross, Rob, Andrew and Gareth and all the rest of the team, obviously, but it's their slides I've mostly uh, stolen. But I think that is it. So uh, thank you very much for your time. I hope that made sense. Thank you so much, Darren. Has anyone got any questions for Darren? Yeah. Great talk. Thank you so much. I, I was curious, since part of this pipeline relies on having 
a tidy CSV going into it, what sort of user training or outreach or coordination are you doing across your different programs in order to make that a reality? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's a good point. So there has to be some upfront costs, and that's what I was kind of saying earlier on about you know changing the culture so you get away from the path of least resistance. There has to be some stuff done. But what we actually find is that our, our, organ our statisticians are using tools like Python, R, you know, maybe macros in Excel, what, but they're using machines to create this data. And then they output an Excel spreadsheet from those machines, which then we have to take away and do something with. So we're actually trying to say, look, you know, we can bypass that step and go straight from one machine to another. So we're doing, at the moment, uh, part of this stuff, I think we published around about 200 odd data sets in this format. Um, that's available and built some data visualizations, as you saw, but we're consulting with the early adopters, the ones who want to change. And I think that's the key bit in an organization. Find out who your allies are, work with them, work through the kinks, right? Because you can't get everything right. You have to work with the stakeholders to make that work. Understand where the gaps are, understand where the pain points are, compromise, work it through, test, iterate, test, iterate, test, iterate. Since so much depends on uh, standards, mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit or give us an example of developing a standard and what that process looked like? How much consultation and how long does it take? Yeah, so we've had a deliberate decision not to, to reinvent any standard or create a new standard. So we haven't had to worry too much about consulting on what that standard might look like. There are lots of good standards that exist. So we've done lots of user research with different data communities in the UK to understand what is that kind of information you need. So is it you know, email address, title, or description? You know, what's the structural metadata look like? How does hierarchies get displayed? So we've gone through and then we've kind of then looked at, well, what standards exist already? So we have like DCAT, you know, which is the data catalogs, Dublin Core, SCOS for hierarchies. There's a specific one for statistical hierarchies called XCOS, RDF. So we pinch them all, right? We build on the shoulders of giants. We don't want to do anything new. So, uh, and then we've tested that out. So we've, you know, we've built things, we've tested it with users. Does it make sense? Does it work? But the kind of application profile is fully extensible. So you can add as much or as little as you want, depending on how much resource and how much information is available. Thank you. Very good talk. Uh, besides you being kindly and trying people to use these new incredible things, did you think or do you have any law or executive order for people to start using this and standardizing all the data set? Do you have something like this? Do you repeat the question? Sorry, I'm not sure. If, if there is any law or executive order to force people to start using this new standard or you just are trying to do it kindly? Yeah, so we want to work in a collaborative way, right? So we don't want to say, here's a new standard, please work to it. That's worked really well for us in the past. <laughs> right? So no, we try to work on that collaborative approach, right? We try to say, look, you know, you do this work, yeah, it's easy, but actually if we can do it slightly different, then it'll make your job easier in the long run. It'll actually be able to allow you to spend more time doing the analysis you want. So we try and dangle some carrots out in front in order to make that work. Of course, there's certain restrictions or freedoms within the laws because we don't want a free for all, right? It can't be the Wild West. Uh, we need to have some sort of structure and framework around things. So we do that consultation. And the idea of working with early adopters is that we can start showing it actually works. We can start with scope. This is real evidence of how this person's done that, what the benefits are, what the impacts have been, and what the users have said. And that makes it more difficult then for other people to say, oh, you got it wrong. We don't like this way of doing it. You provide the evidence-based kind of use case, if you like. So we try and do it kindly. We certainly don't want to force it. Uh, among the people that are producing data that you're asking to adopt these standards, yeah. are there private contractors in the mix? And if so, like what? No? Okay. No, no it's, uh, this is purely um, for the Office for National Statistics. So it's our internal statisticians. However, what we would like to see is this being a kind of, I guess, a catalyst within other government departments who can start using these tools. That's why we've, we've made them open source. We're very interested. We have a community called the Government Statistical Service, 
which which brings all together all the departments and produce stuff to hopefully you know there will be the opportunity for commercial organizations who do provide data to government to do to do things and analysis they may want to join that kind of approach right but let's take let's take one bite at a time let's try not boil the ocean all right that's all we've got time for thank today you so thank you so much darren barnes and thank you everyone for your questions